Now, uh, 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 trifocal presentation, because this my, was only an introduction. So please, uh, I would like to ask to Mr. Alon Balsan uh, from London, United Kingdom, to give his talk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, just before I start, can I just get a show of hands of people that are already using trifocal lens technology or have done? Okay, so it's about half of you. Because um, my background is that pri I started using the, the uh, Rayner trifocal in August of 2017. But prior to this, I was also using um, trifocal technology, but I was using, first of all, uh, the Zeiss and then the fine vision lens and have subsequently transitioned to using this. So um, the so for some of you, it's not about starting the journey. It's possibly about modifying the journey. Um, but I, I do agree that for those of you not using this technology, there's a huge benefit. And in fact, there's a UK high volume cataract surgeon who who uses trifocal technology in 97% of his patients, believe it or not. Maybe that's a little bit too much, but he has a lot of faith in it and a successful practice. Um, so I'm going to show you a retrospective uh, evaluation. Um, of 36 eyes of 18 patients in my own private practice in the UK. Um, I will also talk about a, uh, the background of the lens technology, so m most interested, interesting for those of you maybe already using trifocal technology, but we'll compare some of the um, characteristics of the Rayner trifocal compared to uh, other um, uh, trifocal options. Um, I will show the video implantation technique, um, some of my own personal observations, and there should be time for questions at the end as well. So... Um, basically, we, we looked retrospectively um, at 36 eyes of 18 patients. It was a combination of patients having cataract surgery and refractive lens exchange surgery, probably in about a 50-50 mix. So half of them were refractive lens exchange patients, half of them were um, cataract patients. It's worth saying that amongst the refractive lens exchange patients, there were two or three patients that were functionally emetropic. So in my opinion, the most demanding um, patients that you could select for this kind of technology. Um, and we looked at the preoperative uh, manifest refraction. We looked at uncorrected visual acuity, far intermediate and near. Um, and there's, it says at one month follow-up, the one month follow-up is the minimum follow-up. So because I was starting to use this in August 2017 um, and we evaluated the data, um, more recently, some of these patients have had more than a year of follow-up. And in fact, before I forget, um, I do want to acknowledge uh, um, Ella Kim, who is a wonderful and fantastic resident who helped me with uh, harvesting the data and some of these slides. She's here tonight. Um, so I think most of you are, are European, so the Logmar visions will be more meaningful to you. Um, but essentially, the majority of patients, th these are all the patients, so you can look at the results binocularly and the monocularly. For those of you not familiar with um, trifocal or even presbyopic lens technology, it's normally the case that the monocular vision will be a little bit worse than the binocular vision, um, which is not a problem. Um, the, the near vision were also excellent, um, um, as were the intermediate vision. Intermediate vision normally is one or two lines um, away from where the near vision is, just on account of the fact that the, the, the target is further away. Um, you can see here the cumulative visions. Um, again, the, at least half the patients are really reading at the limits of human vision for distance vision, which is a fantastic outcome. A lot of people are concerned or worried about quality of vision issues with using these lenses. They worry it may impact on a patient's distance vision and they just opt to use a monofocal lens, but you have half of patients here being able to read at the bottom of the chart and 80% of the patients better than what is considered to be normal or perfect vision. Um, and everyone, so every single patient we evaluated was within driving vision standards. Um, the refractive results are very tight. Um, so 90% of eyes within half a diopter and 100% of eyes within three quarters of a diopter. But as some of my colleagues have already said, the preoperative evaluation is, um, is done very carefully. If patients have ocular surface problems or disease, we'll manage it first potentially. The very first thing the patient has done before their vision is even checked is to have the biometry measured, often with a drop of minims normal saline to regularize any problems that may be from the tear film. Um, and then again, the near vision is also fantastic. So, um, uh, patients were, uh, every single one of these patients, so there's 100% spectacle independence with this. I counsel patients that they can expect 97% of spectacle independence based on my experience with other trifocal lenses, but so far we have yet to have a patient that's using glasses for anything. 
Um, we've had three patients uh, develop posterior capsular opacification, of which one was bilateral, so that's four eyes in, um, uh, out of 36, that, and that's at, at up to one year follow-up, although some of the patients have only had it over the last two or three months, so that needs to be interpreted with a bit of caution. Um, all patients report nighttime halos, so that's everyone, um, but no one was complaining of it. So for none of them was it disabling or mild. Um, and in fact, if it wasn't for the fact that we knew we were going to be collecting data, I would have discharged over half of these patients at a two-week follow-up because they had no complaints and were happy with their vision. Um, whoops, have I done something wrong here? That's fine. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you, this has already been covered, the UA one, so I can skip through this. Um, essentially, it's, the same, it's exactly the same platform as the... Mon as the um, monofocal that's already been talked about. It is truly preloaded. Um, six millimeter optic diameter and 12 and a half millimeter overall length. There are no glistenings. I, I like the fact that it's aberration neutral. It's, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that inducing aberration with a lens that you know also does induce aberrations, as do all presbyopic lenses, is something that I'm concerned about. Not all corneas are the same. We make a lot of assumptions about what's going to be unique to that individual patient's cornea. And the fact that it's aberration neutral, I, I find very comforting. Um, it's very stable. It centers incredibly well. Uh, it has a full, big power range, which is, which is also fantastic. Um, the, the diffractive zone is four and a half millimeters. Um, and there are only 16 diffractive steps and rings on it, which I do believe has some advantage um, in terms of reducing quality of vision issues. I'm going to skip through some of these slides for the purposes of time. We know that this anyway, if, for those of you that may be familiar with the more old-fashioned bifocal um, diffractive optics such as like Alcon Restore, the trifocal gives you more vision in the intermediate range, which for patients that do a lot of their work uh, on computers, smartphones, et cetera, et cetera, becomes much more important. The near world is a lot more relevant to patients today than it was even 10 years ago. Um, the, there is a patented diffractive design. I'm gonna compare this to the other lenses uh, with one of the next slides. But this is essentially the profile uh, of the optic for the, for the Ray-1 trifocal lens. These are the main um, alternative lens options that you may be familiar with. Um, and yeah, in my opinion, the fact that there's that unique profile design and the fact that there's less diffractive steps does result in an improved quality of vision for the patients. When you look at the profile here, the thing that's driving intermediate vision with the other lenses um, makes the cutoff point to what's happening in the lens and obviously translating optically into the patient's eye a bit more noisy than what you achieve with the Rayner Ray-1 trifocal lens. So what I've found, and I've done at least 50 eyes now, so I'm presenting 36, but I've continued to use it and I've done more than that, is that patients do tell you they see halos and those halos are distinct and crisp, but complaints of glare are almost, are almost not there at all. Um, and I find glare to be a much more disabling worrying, troubling, and bothersome symptom to patients than halos. If they can see crisp, distinct halos around light sources, they will be less disturbed by quality of vision issues than glare, which distorts the overall quality of the image that they're trying to look at, especially at night. And I think it's because of the design of the lens. Um, there is um, less light loss with a three millimeter pupil than the other lenses, um, and more energy focused on distance, which I think translates into extra, excellent distance and less um, complaints of quality of vision issues. This is just a simulation of this lens compared to some of the um, competitor lenses, which all perform well at a three millimeter pupil size. And as you go to a four and a half millimeter pupil size, the image can be degraded. So as someone's already said, they're all, they're all marketed as being pupil independent, but the reality is there is pseudo accommodation with a smaller pupil. And so you are gonna get improved quality of vision. So nothing is truly pupil independent in my opinion. Um, the, the amount of near ad is very similar uh, to the other, the alternatives. So essentially it's gonna give you a focal point at about 36, 37 centimeters for near and about 75 centimeters for, uh, for intermediate. This is a slightly busy slide. Um, we've already talked about the aberration neutral um, component and all of the others will induce negative spherical aberration, which might be okay in a positively aberrated cornea, but a lot of corneas are negatively aberrated. So if you give a already negatively aberrated cornea um, more negative spherical aberration, then they're going to be more aberrated, and then you're going to give them a trifocal lens as well. I'm not sure it necessarily makes sense. How many people routinely co collect corneal 
aberration data on patients preoperatively. Like almost no one. So basically, no one knows. So if you don't know, don't make the assumption is what I would say. Um, and in fact, there are many cases of monofocal lens implantations in patients that already have negative spherical aberration where they have quality of vision issues on account of the fact there's additional negative spherical aberration. So I think aberration neutral makes sense in all platforms. Um, let's see if we can play this video. Um, so much of the video will be quite unexciting to you, it, it, but essentially there is no, in my opinion, requirement for any modification in the technique to use this technology. So for those of you that are familiar and comfortable with using a uh, monofocal lens, there is no additional surgical concern or requirement for using a trifocal lens. The work and the decision is really in how you select patients, so who are the most suitable patients, um, rather than needing to know anything in terms of surgical manipulation. Um, the, this particular platform is, is very simple for any surgeon familiar with the Ray1 platform, but the, the Ray1 platform is, is, is an easy platform to pick up even for those that are not already using it, in my opinion. It's fully preloaded, so many manufacturers will tell you their lens is preloaded, but you still need to put viscoelastic over the lens and manipulate a little bit here and there before you snap shut the injector. Here, you're just putting viscoelastic through a hole, um, and, then it's, and then it's basically snap shut and ready to go. And it does go nicely through a small incision, so that gives you control over incision size. Um, this actually, I think, was my very first implanta implantation back in August. Um, at this time, the nozzle hadn't been rotated, so there was a requirement to rotate one way and then another. Now the nozzle is pre-rotated, so you just put it in, bevel down, and the, len and the leading haptic goes straight into the bag without any problems whatsoever, um, and the trailing haptic can be, can be dunked in. Because it's a one-handed injector as opposed to an injector that you need to screw, it's quite helpful, especially under topical anesthesia, because you can use your non-dominant hand to counterfixate the eye rather than relying on a patient to look up, look down. So for a wound-assisted technique, I believe the one-handed injectors have a little bit more control. Um, which, is an, which is another benefit. Mm. Uh, you do have the, the second Pekinji image that you can use here uh, to help center the, um, the optic, but it, it tends to center uh, very naturally and very well on its own, so that's really not a requirement. Um, so my post-operative observations, um, some of the patients at two weeks a tiny bit myopic, but when you see them at one month or six weeks, that's gone. Um, all patients report halos, but they're mild. They don't bother the patient. Neuroadaptation, very fast. So to be able to discharge half of your... Uh, trifocal patients at two weeks is not the norm, I would say. Some of them need three months of hand-holding while they adapt to their vision. With this lens, not so much. Um, and forgiving. So small amounts of refractive and cylindrical error. Someone said up to two diopters. I will go up to one point. Depending on whether it's with the rule or against the rule, I'll go up to 1.7 sometimes. Um, and they can have also have limbal relaxing incisions at the time. So I don't miss the fact that there isn't a toric version yet available at the moment. Um, we had no early cases of posterior capture or pacification. I was worried that the posterior capture patient would be more of a problem. It's been much less of a problem. And where it occurs, again, is surprisingly well tolerated. So this lens, in my opinion, tolerates problems that other presbyopic lens options don't tolerate as well. So I'm, I've been really happy with it so far. I've had a couple of patients with a large angle kappa, no problems, no quality vision issues, not a consideration in my opinion. Um, and a high very high percentage of patients achieving better than 6.6 six and N4, which is essentially as good as you could expect for distance and reading uh, and intermediate. Um, I think I'll skip the summary, and now there are time, I think maybe a little bit of time for questions. Thank you.